Special thanks to our new patrons, Marty S., Charles R., Samal P., Pornima, Mark R. And to our five-star reviewers on Apple Podcasts, DC Unit 3D, and SA in CR. Thanks for your support. Welcome to the Golden Shadow. My name is Aaron Rogerson. And I'm Melissa Polizzi. Today we're talking about God, or gods, or deities, and maybe even mythology, or maybe even beyond that. I don't know. But what does it mean when people use the word God? Um, what does it mean when people are experiencing God or having a religious experience? What does it mean for someone to say they have been communicated with by God or touched by God? What is the Christian God compared to, let's say, a Hindu God? We're not going to get into any specific religion or belief system too deeply. We're not trying to really unpack um, traditions as much as we are attempting to explore this concept of God and how it might have evolved in our culture, how it might have evolved in different cultures, because it's sort of a universal thing. This whole idea of the deities is universal across peoples, across nations. Everyone seems to have their own version of gods, which might be different than, than the one god in terms of monotheism. So... This is a very burdened word, God. It's been used in so many different ways to mean so many different things. It can even be interpreted as kind of a catch-all term that people apply to many things that seem to be related to the transcendent or the all-encompassing thing or the one thing. Mm -hmm. All kinds of ideas. But that's what we're exploring today. Yeah, I think also the the sort of exploration around the strained relationship of the present day sort of modern individual, mm. uh, the word God evokes so much, yet also a relationship that people have to it that may feel strained or difficult or sort of laced with uh, certain emotional dynamics. But yeah. even if we feel that we don't have a sense of relationship to a traditional God from a traditional religion, there's a feeling of those powerful universal forces that are at play, you know, like mm -hmm. the forces of nature mm -hmm. and a natural disaster that kind of feels like an act of God or a miracle or something kind of miracle like that feels like that. Yeah. Or maybe a, a type of spiritual practice that is sort of uh, getting you in touch with some sort of divine numinous feeling, and yet it's not layered in a traditional uh, definition of God. Mm -hmm. It kind of takes us back to our episode on the religious function, on the religious instinct. Certainly. There's something so deeply ingrained in our psychology about uh, a connection to the divine. Yeah, um, that would be a good uh, compliment to this episode, yes. just to go back and listen to that. Yeah, and I can't definitely. remember what episode, episode 16 or something like that. Yeah, so there's all of these psychological implications of what God is and how it's tied to our uh, spirit and our like our human DNA. It's so ingrained in us. Mm -hmm. So, how do we start really exploring what God is? Yeah, yeah. I mean, we have to start somewhere. Mm -hmm. um, again, it's a big topic, yeah. and uh, it, it means so many th different things to different people, and mm -hmm. it can mean something so incredibly important and so incredibly powerful to one person, and it can be something incredibly trivial yeah. that is worth, like, um, disdain or mm -hmm. irony mm -hmm. to some people. Yeah. It's like the whole idea of believing in God mm -hmm. to many modern people nowadays is just like it's a joke. Mm -hmm. yeah. Like, what are you, stupid, if you believe in God? Right. And I think that this episode is trying to get into why if you think the idea of God is stupid, mm -hmm. or if you think someone who believes in God must be naive or uneducated, hopefully you might, you know, take a step back from that, maybe uh, reel back that sentiment and kind of understand there is something actually deeper, more complex, 
more powerful about this idea of God than you might think. Yes, absolutely. Um, like I said, there's like this really, sh- the word is strained, but the relationship is strained. And mm. there's a sense of, I think, in many ways across religious traditions that we feel kind of lost and um, the deeper meaning and relationship to it is murky. We don't really know how to be in relationship with God anymore. Mm. So some people kind of shift it to look at God in these different ways or to just totally um, throw out the, the concept altogether. Yeah. But there's something, uh, as I mentioned earlier, sort of very deeply ingrained within us that makes us find this sense of God somewhere. And, and even that sense of understanding the environment through a, a type of projection, really, I don't know, listen to the last episode on projection, because mm-hmm. that's a big part of this, I, I think, as well, is we need to be able to start tapping into inner material and then externalizing it mm-hmm. um, through these different figures, you might say. Mm-hmm. So to start off at the origin Maybe where did God come from? Where did this concept of God or this phenomena of God come from? And I think the best place to start would be with the idea of personification Mm. or anthropomorphization, Mm. which is a big word. Maybe we'll stick with personification for this episode. But there's something about consciousness specific to humans because humans are conscious that is very social. It's very oriented, calibrated. It's structured in terms of human forms. And I think this makes a lot of sense. If you think about it, the thing that gave rise to consciousness has a lot to do with language Mm. and has a lot to do with communicating with others in your tribe. So humans are incredibly social. I would argue that even as an entity, like individuals aren't the real entity. The tribe is the true entity, the true self. Um, We won't get too deeply into that, but humans are very oriented towards other humans and consciousness evolved around the form of other humans. So we can understand that humans might have been the first object to other humans, by which I mean consciousness, the, the way that it kind of forms objects and creates reality. It projects things out. If you, if you watch the last episode, we're projecting objects out into a landscape to, mm. to create reality that the first object that we ever would have really held in our conscious experience would have been another human. Mm. And so what that would mean is that this function of reality structured as a human form would have been exacted upward into personifying more than just other humans to actually personifying objects to personifying Um, patterns Mm. to personifying all kinds of things around us. And you can see this when we recognize this, this sort of phenomena of people seeing faces in things. I think apophenia, I can't remember what the, the term is, but when you see faces in things or you see like a face in the clouds. Like Virgin Mary and the girl cheese. Right. That was a thing. <laughs> right, right. The Virgin Mary, like in like other ways too, like splatters right. on the walls, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. stains and weird well, it's, shapes. It's like nature's Rorschach, right? It's right. like we are highly attuned to find patterns and to uh, kind of develop that into some sort of image that we can relate it to. Mm-hmm. And then there tends to be uh, this particular phenomena where we see a, a kind of divine figure, a yeah. divine image in it. And Mm -hmm. that's potent, powerful. Right. So this whole personification thing, it may seem kind of strange at first glance, but if you think about it, we do do this a lot. Mm -hmm. And you can see this kind of throughout history in some way that personification is an extremely powerful thing. So you can think about the fact that we, for instance, like we name our pets. It doesn't seem very weird, but like, you know, we name our goldfish. The goldfish has a name. Mm. The question is, well, why, are, why are we doing that? Goldfish are not yeah. conscious and you're also not communicating with the goldfish. You're not having any sort of uh, language relationship with the goldfish. Does it really need a name? But the thing is, if you name the goldfish, just like if you name your cat or your dog, mm-hmm. you develop a much more you develop a much more powerful yeah. relationship with that thing. You develop a more 
meaningful spiritual relationship with the goldfish. You start to mm-hmm. feel as if it's like a friend, maybe even a member of your family, even though it's a fish. Yeah. And so what's happening here, it's like you're personifying the goldfish. And by doing so, you have this more meaningful relationship with it. Mm. It helps you be in a relationship that you can create connection to, meaning, understanding, like my guitar. Mm -hmm. It's named Riptide. And it feels kind of like when I grab her, you know, we're we're coming into sync together. Mm -hmm. There's a kind of like ritualistic feeling of grabbing something and holding on to it and then feeling connected to it. And if it was just a guitar, maybe it wouldn't feel as spiritual to me Mm because it it, it doesn't. But I kind of, I don't know, as you were talking about this, I just was thinking about my tendency to sort of uh, personify like almost everything. Yeah. (laughs) It was like the other day cooking uh, a chicken. I was like, I'm going to, I'm going to put this little guy in here. He's going to be comfortable in his little pants. Like, why do I do that? I'm creating this dynamic relationship with these inanimate objects, but it, it feels, it feels good to me to do that. It almost like it continues like the narrative of my life and it, it brings continuity. Right. And I mean, this is an incredibly deep topic that could branch off into another episode, Mm -hmm. of course, but you know, you, you named your guitar a girl. For some it's reason, true. you said her, but the yeah. chicken is a boy. Yeah. And it's like, well, that's interesting. What, is that, what does mm-hmm. that mean? And so these sort of uh, mythological containers that we're yeah. creating all the time, that we're pouring in this narrative energy to, personification does lead into that. Mm-hmm. But mm-hmm. there's po- there's plenty of mm-hmm. other examples like this. Like um, if you name your car, uh, you might develop a sort of more meaningful relationship with your car. You yeah. might feel as if you're going on like an adventure, like like on your steed, like yeah. my car and I, we're traveling the world and here we are. And like um, you might do the same thing with various inanimate uh, features of the land. Yeah. For instance, a lot of formations, especially like big rock formations right. are often named after human figures like the patriarch right. or the three sisters yes, yes. or the seven warriors mm-hmm. or the watchmen. Yeah. Those are all real right. names of real formations around the Southwest where we are. Mm-hmm. And that's strange. Mm-hmm. Why would you name rock formations after people or humans well, as, as <laughs> these big towering humans? Right. I, I think almost the more interesting question is that why does it seem like these things like are not begging, but like calling out to be named. Mm -hmm. For example, we moved. We're in the American Southwest now. There's all these beautiful formations around. We don't know what a lot of their names are because uh, there's so many. Mm -hmm. And what have you done? You've just started naming them. It's like they they called to be named. There's, You look at it and you know that there's something majestic about it. Um, The fact that you have this like beautifully carved formation that's just developed over billions of years it's like this thing deserves respect and honor Mm -hmm. and it needs a name yeah and you've given it a name right and you know if if this comes about naturally (laughs) if you're trying to orient around things like if there was a big rock formation people might start calling like oh it's the rock that looks like a castle Mm -hmm. and that's it becomes castle rock and there's like castle castle rocks like in every state if not multiple castle rocks in every state it's a pretty common name but we want to name things because we want to bring order to those objects yes, so we can yeah. start engaging with them more meaningfully. And yes. so once you give something a name, you can start attributing all these other qualities to it that lie underneath that name. And it's a way yes. of organizing reality. Yes. And you can make those names beautiful or you can make them ugly. Like if there's a rock and you're going to call it turd rock, it's like, I don't like that personally. I don't want to call it turd rock. I don't want my... Uh, phenomenological environment to be ugly yeah it's like i want to call that rock instead like Mm. the obelisk or Mm. something like that's more beautiful to me it's more elegant yeah i like that personally yeah and so i'm sort of designing my reality to be more aesthetically pleasing more powerful a better place to be by Mm. giving things names and by personifying them that's in a step further in giving things sort of attributes for for you to engage with them is to give them human qualities. Right. Yes. You start to look at the qualities of the land, um, their characteristics, um, the kind of emotional energy that you might be picking up all Mm -hmm. of it, especially if you're dealing with something like an ocean or a river, you know, it's, it, it holds so much energy and so much power that especially for like young undeveloped human consciousness, it's like, we, how do we make sense of this? How do we make sense that the river seems to flood at times? 
how do we make sense that, you know, the ocean can kind of come in with a huge tidal wave? Like you look at all old myth of Japan or all these old paintings and you see the giant, giant, like Hokusai style uh, tidal waves. And that's because there's this intense natural phenomena that Mm -hmm. seems to be controlled by something much bigger than ourselves. Right. So the personification helps you come into relationship with it to understand why it might be doing what it's doing. Right. So you can understand if, if you would name your goldfish and if you would name a rock after something, you can understand how you might start to we're not even start to, if, if you go back in time, you would understand that people have a less materialistic relationship with reality and mm-hmm. they have a more, um, you might say experiential or phenomenological relationship with reality. And so they're not just na- uh, naming objects, materialists they are actually naming patterns or forces mm, yeah. or experiences. And you can see the, the world becomes much more kind of colorful and almost more childlike if you like experience things this way. So like you're saying, you might start to name various experiences mm. um, and that gives them more power. It gives them more meaning. You have to develop a more spiritual relationship with them yeah. and you can engage with them in this much more effective way that starts to create this higher resolution relationship. There's more texture. There's yeah. more affordances yeah. when things are personified. Mm. And so like you're saying, the river or the flood mm-hmm. or the ocean, yeah, they're not just like material objects. They're almost kind of like forces. They're like these mm-hmm. experiences. They're these, um, these patterns in your life that really affect it in a strong way. Yeah. And it makes sense that if you wanted to engage with the river as something that you actually have a positive, healthy relationship with. You have a mm-hmm. positive, healthy relationship with the land. Yeah. And that's actually going to be adaptive. That's going to make you survive better. Yeah. You might personify the river. Absolutely. You might start to give it a name, mm-hmm. whatever name you th- see to be fit. And you might start to think of it as being something that has human qualities. And if it has human qualities, you can actually engage with this phenomenon of river or Mm -hmm. river force Mm -hmm. and engage with it more meaningfully. Yes. Um, I think something you said earlier really caught me, which is like, it's bringing a lot of order or maybe just understanding and meaning because we're tapping into this uh, idea of these patterns of experience, patterns of being, you might say. Mm -hmm. And when we run into them and we recognize that there seems to be almost this like um, this hierarchy of power or forces that are at play, you know, I cannot control that the river floods. Mm -hmm. So what can I do? How can I bring order to this? You start to personify the river into a God and that Mm -hmm. God requires a sacrifice, right? So Mm -hmm. once a year, you make sure you go out, you do this big ritual. It's, you start to see how these things develop over time. Or if we even scale back to the flood myths that we covered in episode 26, I believe, yeah, all of them sort of concluded with that like flood hero doing some sort of ritual, mm. you know, uh, Noah does something for Yahweh, Prometheus yeah. um, does um, something to, to appease Zeus. All of this needs to be done to atone or to become um, kind of brought back into better relationship with the forces yeah. uh, with God, you might say, that mm. had caused this destruction or this natural force. So our way of tapping into this natural kind of universal hierarchy, recognizing that in some ways we are not in control of everything, what can we control? Mm-hmm. Well, we can control the rituals we do. You know, we can control kind of starting to talk to God. You mm. know, all of these things that have developed over time and turned into prayers and commandments and tenants, all of these things are part of being in relationship with the greater force of reality. Right, right. And I think, you know, someone who's very skeptical might say, well, like we're doing a ritual doesn't do anything. <laughs> you know, if you want to get into a better relationship with the river, it's like doing a, a ritual for the river doesn't do anything <laughs> because there is no God. There is no God who's paying attention. Mm. The God is not a person or a being. You can't haggle with it. They might, you know, throw out all these things, but that's not true. Mm. That's wrong, actually. Yeah. If you develop a relationship with the river, there are ways, which in fact you do haggle with it. Yeah. There are ways in which you learn to respect it mm. and sort of be around it. One way to respect it is like you don't just swim in it freely mm. without thinking about it or being cautious. Yeah. And if you start to treat the river in that way uh, as a heuristic, as something that kind of works, maybe isn't perfect, but it gets the job done, let's say, as a heuristic, don't swim in the river 
uh, carelessly. Mm -hmm. Because why? Because the river god might get angry at you for like spoiling its waters. Right. But the truth is that if you actually treat the river that way, you might not drown as much. Right, exactly. You might not as lose as many items mm-hmm. in the river that, you know, you need to keep safe. Um, you might start to feel like the river is something that needs to be protected. If mm-hmm. something has, I don't know, fallen into the river that's gross, you might want to get it out. And there's all these ways that you're keeping the area clean. Mm-hmm. You're developing this respect for it. You're paying more attention to how you act around it. Yeah. It's it's hard to really fathom precisely how this like might work in every instance, yeah. but you could understand how developing some sort of respectful relationship with the ocean, for instance, right. might be adaptive. It right. might help you. It might make you more functional in some way, even if that means just getting more in touch with the rhythms of the ocean yes. Yes. and the rhythms maybe show you where's the best place to fish. Yes. What's the best time to fish. Mm-hmm. Um, what should I not do towards the ocean if mm. I want to stay safe, if I want my children to stay safe? Mm-hmm. It's hard to understand what they might be, but you can begin to see the bigger, bigger picture here, which is like you actually develop a functional adaptive relationship with yeah. this thing by turning it into some sort of deity. Right. And uh, you're tapping into what I think is what's really coming through for me, which is about being in tune with the rhythms of Mm. right now we're talking about nature basically like across the board. Mm -hmm. So say, you know, you have an old tribe that um, has a settlement right next to an active volcano and there was an incident where it erupted in some way or overflew in some way. Mm -hmm. And they could personify that as this, you know, angry volcano god you know maybe something that you see in certain um hawaiian myths i'm not sure but they know then right yes so then you know that based on this experience based on the anger of say the gods that Mm. they that they moved and maybe it happened again and they moved again and then they moved again and then it worked you know what i mean like there's you're you're tweaking and refining the relationship to the land and to nature or maybe you notice that seasonally there's this um, you, you have like a, an intense rainy season, you yeah. guys get, uh, water and water and water and water. And you learn that this area gets flooded. Mm-hmm. And of course, to make sense of that, especially with that, um, less refined of, uh, consciousness without technology, all the yeah. things we have now, yeah. you're, you're working through this almost like experimental, uh, back and forth, this dance with nature mm-hmm. where you're learning what works and what doesn't work. And yeah. then you come into relationship, you, you come into relationship with it, you build rituals, mm-hmm. you build kind of, uh, almost like the instructional ways of how to be in relationship with it. And that becomes the spiritual practice right. and people survive then or are more likely right. to. Right. So that's, that's kind of a functional explanation of this. And there's, yeah. but there's different things than just I mean, it, it's kind of convoluted, but that's very functional. Like saying, you do, if you do this, it's adaptive and you survive. Yeah. But there's also sort of the angle that, like, I guess it's still functional, but some some of this sort of personification is just reflective of how we actually relate to reality. Mm-hmm. So, the volcano erupting. The most intrinsic natural way to respond to that is to think that the volcano is angry mm-hmm. or something. Yeah. Why? Because again, the humans are the first object, mm. the first phenomenological thing that you, your entire reality is built around and it's sort of an evolutionary timeline is a human being. So you're really in tune. Everything about you is really in tune with this whole notion of emotions and words mm. and figure forms of the human body. So everything that you experience in reality, the the whole idea that like the first way to experience reality is materialistically, Mm. like, oh, this is wood, obviously, and I'm not going to wood, and like, this is metal, obviously, and the table is a table, and like, everything's made up of atoms. It's like, that's actually incredibly counterintuitive. Mm. What's much more intuitive is that everything has like spirit. Yeah. Everything has emotion in it. Everything has feelings in it. What's reality? Reality is kind of like a big human <laughs> it's yeah. a big human that gets angry mm. or it gets sad yeah. or it wants things for me or uh, it punishes me if I haven't done a good job. You can see how this might be a more instinctual way to interact with reality than our very modern materialistic mm. viewpoints, which are only brought about because of like the scientific revolution. They're actually pretty recent as far as a way of looking at reality. Yes. And, and like I said, I think uh, that instinct is still brewing under the surface mm-hmm. by, you know, 
reading a fantasy book like Game of Thrones and it's like, oh, they name all of their weapons, you know, or you're naming your car, as we mentioned, there's this instinct that we have to connect to the, the, the object, but Mm. how do we connect to it without it having a face, quote unquote, without it having a personality, Mm -hmm. an attitude, we have to create it into a human that we can get to know. Yeah. And a different way of thinking about this is also that like we might even personify, like I said, experiences. Mm-hmm. So for instance, like anger yes. and love mm-hmm. and sadness, mm-hmm. um, these things also might be personified into their own yes. beings. Yes. And you might get deities mm-hmm. that are like, what's this deity? It's like the deity of love mm, yeah, or the deity of anger yeah. maybe or the deity of insanity. Mm. Or you know that feeling when like reality doesn't make sense anymore and you're just descending into like oblivion and you don't know what the hell is going on? Like there's a deity of that. Yeah. Why is that happening to you? It's because this God is doing it. Yes. And so you can understand that there are there are deities and I don't know enough about this, but maybe this is like more of a sort of a Western like Greek thing. Yeah, definitely. Absolutely. Um, of just personifying various aspects of human experience yeah like these it's like the feeling of like these autonomous forces that Mm. take over us and you can kind of tie them more to like a sort of psycho like biological framework but if we kind of go back to this natural instinct that we have we see that there is this tendency to deify um to personify these um these forces these archetypal situations you know being struck by cupid's arrow has brings this quality of immediate love Mm. and passion Mm. and lust you know it's like oh my god like i need this person and in the stories um cupid eros he that was his job you know he would go around and kind of from the corner like boop you know medea they shot her with an arrow and she yeah. fell in love with Jason. Yeah. So there's this feeling of being taken over by something or yeah. with, um, with Aries, with Mars, that's the same feeling. It's like that the war rally, the feeling of sudden anger taking over you. I've been possessed by Aries. I didn't mm. do this. Me, the individual Aries did it, you know, right. or, or moving into that like ecstatic drunk space space that's like the Dionysian kind yeah. of like a uh, mindset you mm-hmm. know it's it it makes sense that that uh, so something that started so fundamentally as a way to understand nature and reality gets turned to how do we understand what's happening to us yeah these deep inner forces that seem to take over us you might even say it's like the the deep inner complexes and the psychology that activate and as they constellate you're taken over ego consciousness kind of pushes aside mm. and something else is there so how do you make sense of it right well, turn it into a deity right this, this kind of reminds me of uh by cameral <laughs> mind by julian Jaynes, mm. which i'll admit is actually not a book i've read but i, I kind of know of it and he's he's sort of making the ar- argument that like whatever we call the unconscious now Mm -hmm. or our awareness of this thing that's like the unconscious or the awareness of self as being more than just like your experience, your like conscious ego experience. Mm -hmm. That wasn't something that we even really got in touch with until like 1000 BC or something like that, 2000 BC that he's saying that like we interpreted everything about the unconscious all the unconscious contents all the things that are pouring into conscious reality from someplace unknown from mm-hmm. beneath the surface yeah we just attributed all those things to being deities huh. or forces yeah and it wasn't till like kind of recently in human history you know 1000 bc something like that that we mm-hmm. kind of started to come in touch with this idea of like the unconscious or aspects of your <laughs> mind that are right. just beneath the surface yeah before that it's like oh it's all just gods <laughs> playing with us Well, it's an easier story to follow, you know, it's a narrative that can help you make sense of what has happened when you feel taken over. It's like you're doing someone else's bidding. Mm -hmm. And without that insight, without that meaning making machine inside of us that sees that pattern in everybody, like I got angry and so did my uncle and my neighbor the other day. It's Mm -hmm. like, oh, there's, there's this greater being, something higher than us, that, that natural sort of hierarchical nature of our yeah. psyche that that is kind of putting things into order mm-hmm. that says you know how can i make sense of this situation right why did this person snap yeah. and beat up that other person oh well 
they were taken over by, you know, by the God of Ares. Right. And there was that bloodlust inside of them. Mm-hmm. Does that absolve them of that sin? Oftentimes when that happens, then there has to be some sort of repentance. They have to do a bunch of deeds. And, and so you start to see this kind of inner and external experience of meaning making of, of all of these experiences, especially around the forces inside of us that just don't make any sense to consciousness. Right, right. So this personification pattern, this, this creation of deities as some sort of representation of reality or a way of organizing our reality into objects that make sense, objects that we can now engage with powerfully and meaningfully, objects that we can that we can play with and pass around in order to navigate life more effectively. That's mm-hmm. what we're doing with personification is we're giving things all these human qualities in order to mm-hmm. engage with them more meaningfully. Mm-hmm you can see how that would evolve over time to be powerful and how it would evolve to help us explain reality, help make sense of it, help organize it, help keep it ordered. Yeah. Right. A lot of that's what is happening. And, you know, the most stereotypical way of explaining gods is that like, it's like something that quiets anxiety. Mm -hmm. It's just superstition. It's just a way of explaining reality. And there's truth to that. And that's part of of what we're tapping into. We're tapping Mm -hmm. into this personification, this deification of reality (laughs) Helps us actually understand it, helps us work with it, helps us make sense of it. But the misconception there is that, like, that's stupid. Mm. It's like that you would only do that if you were an idiot. And that, like, <laughs> again, the materialism, understanding the objects is just stuff, mm. that that somehow precedes deification. Yeah. And that's backwards. Deification proceeds materialism. Mm. Yeah. That's something that's important to understand. Yeah. But you can see how. This would evolve into what we don't really think of as polytheistic, yes, um, yeah. belief systems, which or is much p- older, pantheons, right? Yes, much more right. ancient way right. of uh, being in relationship to our religious function and to reality. We have, of course, Hinduism, um, ancient Egyptian uh, pantheons, ancient Greek pantheons. Mm-hmm. Um, there's this sense of very, very very old culture that developed a whole array of gods, um, which often for the most part are not, um, omnipotent. They're not omniscient, yeah. not all powerful. They, uh, there's sometimes kind of like a ruling head, but at the same time, there's more of a tendency towards several gods with lots of different energy to them, personality mm-hmm. traits, their own stories, and that was really like the the most archaic form of us deifying things. Right, right. And this is tricky. Again, I don't know enough about this. I don't know, know enough about history to really make grand statements about this. But the polytheistic belief systems, this these sort of pantheons or this way of explaining reality in which you're sort of organizing it by having all these deities that interact with each other, mm. and that's reality. Yeah. You can see how that would continue to evolve continue to culturally be sort of squeezed to create more and more complex belief systems and how it might sort of start to create a kind of hierarchy of gods mm-hmm. where it might mean that like certain gods are in command of other gods yes. or certain gods represent a more kind of meta all encompassing aspect of reality. Mm-hmm. And a good example might be like Zeus. Mm-hmm. Zeus is sort of at the top of the hierarchy of gods for some reason. And the question is why, why is there a hierarchy of deities that's evolving? Yes. Um, I don't know. There's, I can't say with a hundred percent certainty that this is true, but I remember reading somewhere that there was more of a movement towards Zeus becoming a higher God, kind of the more that the culture grew, uh, the more society grew and the more Mm. like, uh, kind of like the greater hand of philosophy was coming into being. And there Mm. was kind of more of this sense making around the pantheon and that continued to sort of raise Zeus up. Mm. Um, which I think is interesting is it's, it's kind of showing evolution of the gods and that something tends to, uh, kind of push out to the very top of it. Right. Even in Hinduism, I think that's sometimes not even considered polytheism because there is kind of like a penultimate God. Mm-hmm. There is um, something that we do worship more of at the very top rather than Ganesha and Shiva and Shakti. Like there's more of, um, there's more of the Godhead that you might say that, yeah. that kind of evolves 
um, for us to recognize something that centralizes the religious experience. Right. So I think one way of looking at this is, again, to kind of return back to this sort of functional understanding of deities and personification as something that would evolve because it's adaptive. It actually helps you. Mm. And you might understand that certain deities might evolve certain rituals associated mm. with them. Yeah. They might start to evolve certain practices that are associated with them. They might even start to develop their own philosophies of life mm. associated with them. For instance, like the God of fire, again, this is a very contrived example, but let's say the God of fire might have certain rituals that evolve. There are fire rituals yeah. that for some reason end up being more advantageous to the practitioners of it Yes. Then the people who are doing water rituals of the water god, mm. let's say. And the fire god might have certain philosophies that develop that have to do with the fire element, let's say. And those philosophies um, create these sort of sets of rules and standards and yes. ways of behaving that end up mm. being advantageous. Yes. And they catch on. And you can understand how the fire god, if if interacting with the fire god aspect of reality, this personified reality... If this engagement with this aspect of reality mm -hmm. becomes adv advantageous, mm -hmm. you can see how the fire god would start to sort of ascend. Yes, yeah. And you yeah. would start to see a hierarchy of where like the fire god somehow is becoming more powerful than the water god mm -hmm. because the fire god's rituals, and it might just be complete, complete coincidence, it might just yeah. be this cult of fire for some reason developed cool rituals that end up being really good. But either way, you, you, begin to, you might begin to see a hierarchy of gods that right. emerges because of the effect this phenomenology basically mm. the fire aspect of reality this personified fire the way that it starts to affect a human behavior the way that it starts to affect human culture um becomes advantageous mm. and in sort of like survival of the fittest understanding the fittest god with the fittest practices and rituals might be the fire god and it will send up the hierarchy right and so you can see how that might be one way of understanding why a hierarchy of gods might emerge mm. Another way might be that like one uh, one nation's set of gods, uh, the nation con conquers another nation essentially, mm -hmm. and those gods mingle with the conquered gods, and maybe just artificially the conqueror's gods gets placed above the conquered gods, and yeah. you have this weird mingling of pantheons, yeah. and yes. you begin to like have like a, a strange sort of like cultural mimetic as in meme you might yeah. say mimetic breeding yeah. of that's, these deities yeah that's the fusion of like the greco greco-roman pantheon it's like right. romans uh had their own kind of gods but like greek culture kind of came in and it it just sort of took over it and they fused together right mm -hmm. you know like jupiter became zeus um right. and it's like well why did that happen in some ways there was a grander story and there was more of a there was more narrative, I think, it, uh, that was associated. More rituals that were associated mm -hmm. with with the with the Greco side of the pantheon, yeah. and the Roman side was much looser. So it kind of came in and was adopted and brought in because it brought more structure to yeah. Roman life. It brought more insight into why things are happening the way that they are. And the names of certain deities sort of stayed the same in, on the Roman side, but they took on the qualities of, uh, of, the, of the pantheon from Greece. Right. So that's where you start to see that kind of um, dynamic at play. Mm -hmm. It gets adopted in because it, it works and it works better than what was there before. Right, right. And so... <sighs> This is kind of, you know, a, a long walk through these concepts to like where we're trying to get here. But, you know, thank you for being patient with this, this story that we're telling. But eventually you might have an evolution, an innovation, you might say. And we want to be careful because it's, it's, it's hard to say that this is an innovation upon polytheism because, you know, you might be saying that Judaism is better than Hinduism or something like that, which is complicated. We're not, we're not trying to say that. But the one God... Is something that would eventually evolve as a product of this process, this evolutionary process. Mm -hmm. The hierarchy of gods yeah. might keep going until eventually you have this huge innovation in the one god. There's mm -hmm. only one god actually, and he is all powerful. Yeah. And that's this new way of thinking about this. Mm -hmm. And the one god is a different idea than the pantheon. Yeah. It's different than the polytheism. 
it's related to the hierarchy of gods, the mighty evolve, but it is in many ways, you can't think of the one God as merely just being mm. similar to like, Oh, the God of the river. Right. It's like, yeah. no, it's something different completely. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like the personification of all of reality itself yeah. Yeah. into one object. Yes. One transcendent object, yeah. which is the one God, the all powerful God mm -hmm. and all other gods are fake. Yeah. And that's weird. Yeah. Well, because I think under the one God, under this dynamic of like all powerful reality within that is like still nested the sort of polytheistic themes and lessons and experiences mm -hmm. where you kind of have this sense that, I don't know, this is a way to maybe think about it, at least from a more psychological perspective, is that polytheism was helping us tap into these like deeply sort of singularized um archetypal experiences yeah like tending the hearth and mm -hmm. making sure it doesn't go out and taking that mother flame to another city right um hestia hestia right yes um but after that sort of singular archetypal experience there's something kind of greater. There's the the guiding force of reality. There's, mm -hmm. if we're looking at, at this from the Jungian perspective, especially, it's like rather than worshiping just the single archetypal image, you, you're you worshiping the self, which is like the penultimate God figure. Mm -hmm. That is that which is ordering reality. It is the picture of wholeness. It is that which is guiding the path of individuation. And that is bigger than falling in love or getting drunk or going to war that's what life is about, mm -hmm. individuation, and that's mm -hmm. the self, and that's God, that's the God image. So it's almost this this evolution towards greater complexity of life as we were able to understand it more and more or even have the ability to not worry so much about tending the fire, mm -hmm. we could focus on the greater, uh, I don't know, the greater, uh, the greater purpose of humanity. Right, so we're kind of like, we keep hyperlinking past episodes into this but <laughs> it, if, if this was text there would be a hyperlink on these <laughs> words we're saying but uh higher self and the yeah. structure of becoming was episode 24 or right, something right. I, I think these are all wrong all these numbers <laughs> we're throwing out there but that's that's a previous episode we did where we're talking about sort of the structure of becoming yeah. talking about the Jungian self which is mm -hmm. what Melissa is alluding to yeah and sort of like the aim of individuation yeah and young you know I think sort of put forward the idea that like the self is sort of like the Christ archetype or something like that. He, yeah, he related yeah, it to Christianity yeah. quite often. Yes, definitely. Um, but you can understand this. What I was just saying is, is the one God is not just an explanation of reality. It's not mm -hmm. just something that makes you feel less anxious about your existence. It's not just a way of putting order to your experience as much as, as it is a structure of morality yeah it's a yeah. structure of guidelines and yes. laws and rules mm -hmm. and you know i think it's easy to respond to that we'll say well it's not real mm -hmm. all that morality isn't real all those yeah. laws are real are not real there's no actual rules that you have to follow mm. and it's a naive perspective yeah i would say um because Actually, life does have rules and mm -hmm. actually there are things that you want out of life, whether yeah. or not you think so, that you're trying to go for. Yeah. And that actually is the structure of your reality. Yeah. And so if we think of reality as being something that you haggle with, for instance, meaning that you need to sacrifice things in order to get things in reality, you need to sacrifice time in order to construct something worthwhile. Um, you need to sacrifice loads and loads of sex with unlimited partners in order to get married and have a children and raise a family. Life is about sacrifices. Yeah. And you can understand that if you were going to personify that idea, just mm -hmm. as one example, but if you were going to personify the concept of sacrifice, something that pays off, you might get something like the one God mm. who wants you to do things, who wants you to behave a certain way yeah. and will actually reward you for making sacrifices, making correct choices in life, mm -hmm. putting off things that you desire very deep way yeah. in a very superficial way in favor of things that you actually want in a deeper way. Yeah. And so this personification of all these dynamics, all these structures in our experience, in mm -hmm. our lives, um, the idea of like you shouldn't lie, mm -hmm. that's, a, that's a structure of reality. And you might say, well, that's just BS. It's just a made up law. There's no law that says you can't lie. Mm. And it's like, yeah, okay, we'll try it. 
try actually going around just lying all the time and see mm-hmm. how it works out for you. Mm-hmm. You'll find that you don't make many friends that way. You'll find that no one trusts you. You'll mm-hmm. find that no one wants to be in a, a relationship with you. Yeah. No one wants to have a family with you if you lie all the time. It's almost like reality has a law that says don't lie. Yeah. And if you personify that law, if you personify that reality, you have something that resembles God. Yeah. And you might understand how this idea begins to evolve. Right. Um, sort of continuing the train of thought of this as this the sort of psychological concept like monotheism is this worship of the integrative self of the god image the moral structure that keeps you on that path of individuation and Mm. the if you don't follow that what will follow is often the sense of life breaking down neurotic symptoms, anxiety, depression, extreme emotional irregularity. Mm -hmm. There seems to be a corrective element within the psyche. Like anyone who's been listening to our episodes, we talk about this all the time. It's like dreams compensate for a conscious attitude that's off. There seems to be something within us instinctually that's trying to balance the scales, to put us back on the moral road of, of development and transformation to become who we are meant to be. And that is God. That is that which ultimately is controlling reality within us subjectively, but also for others. And to be in relationship with it means that we can not do everything the same. You know, it doesn't mean like everyone has to play by the exact same book, but at the same time, there's, there's a pattern there. Mm -hmm. Like, don't lie. Don't be an asshole. Don't be violent. Don't right. don't steal these things that make sense if you look at it as a uh, as rules for life. And these yeah. rules for life guide you on uh, at least setting the environment up for you to step more and more into the person that you're meant to be. Right, right. I think it's it's again. I think it's it would be kind of naive for someone to think that that life has no rules. Yeah, because you can actually go through everyone's everyone's individual life but everyone's life through history and you can mm. actually see patterns yeah life has patterns yeah people have patterns as they live there is sort of an experience of like what it means to go through puberty and come of age mm. turns out if you are a young male and you are now 18 there's a pattern that you've gone through that a lot of other young men have gone through right. and it's not just completely relative it's like every life is completely like different than everyone else's life it's like no there are actual patterns Mm. because there are actual structures to our reality there's actually structures to our existence and um you can test this theory of like well you can you don't have to like do anything that anyone says you don't have to pay attention to any rules or laws you can test it and it won't work out and you wouldn't want to live in a society where people don't follow some sort of basic guidelines and like the guidelines you just said of like don't lie, don't steal, don't cheat, yeah. don't kill, yeah. uh, don't rob other people. Yeah. It's like that's the kind of society you want to live in is one like that that has those guidelines. But, you know, as opposed to the opposite, the opposite society is not one you want to live in. Right. But yeah. if you examine that, you can see that like that's very much what the sort of one God in these different religions or even like, you know, the God at the type of top of the hierarchy of the polytheistic religions, yes. yeah. you can see that there's so much overlap yeah. with these sort of instructions, these yeah. guides, yeah. this notion of the path that you should be walking, the notion of sinning, which means to like deviate from the path. It's like you see a lot of the same patterns and it's not because it's all made up superstition. It's no, it's actually a way of mapping out reality. Yeah. Like the eight limbs of yoga maps onto the eight noble truths in Buddhism. Mm-hmm. It's like, oh, there's something that worked here. Yeah. And it was passed down through this religious and spiritual tradition. And it spreads because it's helping people live in a way that's uh, more right, quote unquote, mm-hmm. um, allowing them to kind of move through relationships for society to grow, for culture to grow. And that gets... Uh, nestled ultimately under something that must be respected Mm. and it's a little bit easier to do that when it's there's an ultimate god who's who's saying that Mm -hmm. so just to go through some like reflection on this idea Mm. to uh, well also i want to be clear that just because someone says they believe in god does not mean they understand god in the way that we're describing and it also doesn't mean they're actually adhering to any rules or like living life in a good way mm. you know just because someone says like oh i'm like a godly person it's not that simple 
you, you can't you can't just say that or you can't just say like i believe in god and that's that's it like yeah. you, of course you do we're saying that god is something that's much more convoluted much more complex much more mysterious much more gray but it's still real just because something is complex does not mean it doesn't exist and god is something that's very complex and so you can play around with this you can play around with personification mm. you can go back to the start of this episode and you can play around with that idea Try personifying things around you. Mm -hmm. Try personifying your car. Try personifying your computer. <laughs> you can try personifying some natural feature that you live by or even an unnatural feature like a building. You could give a building a name and you'll find that if you start to do this, that like you can actually develop strange, more meaningful relationships with these things and overall more meaningful relationship with reality. Um, you could also go insane and, you know, if you're schizophrenic, you might be hearing voices and you're personifying weird phenomena that maybe you shouldn't be. And that's the extreme. And that's, it's, it's fair to kind of think about that of like going overboard with personification. But, um, you can also explore this concept of God, uh, understand that it's more complicated than you probably think it is. Study these religions, understand what are the beliefs here? What does God actually mean? Talk to someone who's educated in this. Um, and yeah, I think you'll find that if you, if you understand reality as something that has rules and structures and something that you can actually engage with meaningfully, something that you can make a trade with, you can trade some of your energy and reality will reward you for it. You can trade some of your time and reality will reward you for it. And if personification does make your relationship with things more powerful, more meaningful, if you personify reality, you might find that you can engage with it more effectively. And so this is tough, but you might find that you can develop a relationship with God. And that's not coming from someone who is Christian. And that's not coming from someone who's trying to push you to become Christian. That's not what I mean. I mean that I have a personal relationship with God, but it's my own understanding of what that is. And it actually is powerful to me. It actually helps me make sense of my reality. It actually helps me make, it helps me make sense of myself and it's something to think about at the very least. Okay, we have a dream from a member of our audience. This is from a 26 year old male. The dream scene starts with a feeling of existential terror and dread, kicking and screaming to go back. I open my eyes to see that I'm about one quarter mile out from the shore, and I'm terrified about not being able to swim. When I stopped worrying, I found that I could swim, and I made it back to shore. Walking to the beach's exit... I encountered a burly man who was angry with me. His girlfriend had told him that I was rude to her. He pulled a pane of glass out of his pocket and threw it at me, a piece lodging in my leg. The lifeguard, a woman, took a look at me, saying that it was a deep cut in there. Hmm. Well, I think the first thing that jumped out to me about this dream of course is the setting the beach the ocean being actually in the water as the dream ego kind of comes into realization of the scenery so on that kind of grander collective symbolic scale we look at the ocean as a symbol of the unconscious the kind of deep unknowable depths there's these emergent beings inside there's fear yet there's wonder and curiosity so he kind of wakes up or comes to consciousness and realizes that he's out pretty far in the ocean and there's this feeling of terror, of uncertainty, of fear. Am I going to drown, basically? And it's interesting because in the dream you see a shift already in mm -hmm. that attitude. He kind of calms down and he realizes that he can swim. But instead of staying in the water, instead of diving under, he swims to shore. So, you know, I don't really know exactly the state of this dreamer's um, kind of waking life, but there seems to be a reflection at least in a sort of shift in 
a certain capability of being able to handle a situation yet not a full realization of his capabilities mm-hmm. because there's still kind of that fear of the ocean. There's still sort of a fear of the deep watery depths. Um, he's still trying to get out of there. He's trying to get out of the beach and then run in, runs into this altercation. So something in the unconscious is like, uh, uh-uh, uh, you're not just out of here, Scott free. Like mm. it's time for an altercation with these interesting figures. So, I'm curious if this dreamer was to keep noting down their dreams. Does the theme of the ocean come back? Is there a fear of water still? Does anything change that allows them to stay in those depths or something symbolically at least representative? Like you get on a boat and you go back out, like whatever it is. Because there seems to be more to the the situation, more development that's kind of on the horizon that's waiting to happen. Yeah. Um, I'm struck by how this scene supposedly starts with something that's terrifying. Oh yeah. Um, it does kind of make me wonder, and maybe this isn't related specifically to this dream, but like the idea of a stress dream is very common Mm -hmm. where you're in some place that you don't actually want to be. Yeah. Or there's just a a huge amount of anxiety surrounding something that you have to do, something that you're confronted with. And there's more extreme versions of that. And this Mm -hmm. is kind of a more extreme version. Mm -hmm. I mean, for me, it's like I never have dreams like this, but I have dreams where I'm like showing up in class and we have a test. Yeah, typical. That that happens to me all the time. Mm -hmm. But like showing up in a class and there's a test is Mm -hmm. like, is that different from showing up in an ocean (laughs) and like not being able to swim? Right, right. It's like, well, it's like the ocean's more extreme. So Yes. There's a similar theme kind of undertone to that Mm -hmm. and... The dreamer mentions that they recently left their stable career to study psychology okay. just this past September, and they're finding it difficult, and here's very interesting wording, to manage the tsunami of oncoming assignments. Yeah. So we're dealing with the floodwaters. We're dealing with chaos, the primordial mm. chaos of big, big change. And there's this inner tension going on between being able to handle everything, kind of feeling like you're suddenly out in the water with no safety net, with uh, no buoy yeah. and, and, and something's going to take you under. So I certainly think that life situation has a big role in this particular dream, the right. feeling of not knowing if they have the capabilities to handle what's happening. Right. But then finding that they do have the capabilities. Yes. And, you know, it makes you wonder, is the unconscious trying to tell you that? It's trying to say, you can do this. Yeah. I know that you're stressed out, but it's okay. Relax. Mm -hmm. You can handle this. Like you're ready to do this. Yeah. Um, Yeah. You open your eyes and you realize you can swim. Yeah. And in that moment when kind of eyes are closed, that's the feeling that you're maybe even closing yourself off to certain elements that are very obviously in your awareness. Mm -hmm. Like (laughs) there's like this video of like a little kid, like hanging on to like a, he's in a pool and he's screaming his head off because he thinks he's drowning and like the mom kind of taps him and he realizes he can stand up Mm. it's like a similar feeling right Right. we close our eyes we kind of block ourselves off to certain truths of Mm -hmm. reality of the situation and we're running through some sort of narrative of fear i can't do this overwhelm and then you open your eyes and you realize you can do it Right. But then there's that interesting tension. The dream turns because he was worried and freaked out and then became calm. But then he was confronted by this big burly man. Yeah, I feel like a lot of the dreams we've gotten have actually had this kind of pattern mm-hmm. where it sort of seems like you've kind of figured it out. Yeah. But then there's like another obstacle mm. or like you uh, are confused and you find your way, but then you realize you forgot your luggage and you have to go back. Right. Yes. Um, or saying like, oh, okay, like I've finally uh made it out of like this like flaming vehicle Mm. but then like all of a sudden there's just like a huge like cliff that like is in front of me and so this tension that the unconscious is sort of playing with or the unconscious is playing with a tension in your life which is like fear it's like can you do this or can you not do this yeah you need to be more confident but be reasonable Mm. don't be overconfident don't Mm -hmm. be stupid um, and I think that a lot of our lives, especially when we're in moments of stress, have to do with this, which yeah. is finding a balance mm. where it's not just simply like all one direction or all the other direction. Yeah. It's not like just like freak the fuck out mm. or have absolute confidence in everything that's going on. It's mm-hmm. like, no, you need to kind of be vigilant yeah. to navigate this difficult path. Yeah. But also like don't freak out or just fall off the cliff. Mm. So. Obviously, that tension is playing here, and if he's going back to school, 
I mean, nothing freaks me out more than the idea of going back to school personally. So I can un- understand why you might have a dream that you're drowning in an ocean if yeah. you were going back to school. Yeah. Let's look at these other figures in the dream. Um, you know, uh, uh, we will take the stance that these are all like subjective representations of the dreamer's psyche. Yeah. So you have like big, burly, scary man who's attacking. That's often the personification of the shadow figure inside of ourselves, something that's threatening, that actually might hurt us, that is violent towards us, that incites a feeling of fear. Mm. Um, what does burly mean? Like big and, I don't know, I keep seeing like a big, hairy guy. That's what like I think of. Scary like, lumberjack. It's kind of like a guy <laughs> with like a wife beater and like hairy chest and like a gold chain. It's kind of okay. like I think when I hear the word burly. <laughs> It's, this is not the first time He's, I've heard the word burly. I, I don't just, know. I'm just realizing, like, what does that actually mean again? Like, I don't feel like you hear that word that often. Just like big, just big. hefty, strongly built. Strong, an intimidating figure. Intimidating. Yeah. Maybe hairy. I don't know. Right. <laughs> the kind of guy who would say, hey, you were rude to my girlfriend. Right. Exactly. Because that's what happens in the dream. Yes, this is what happens in the dream. <laughs> He's being confronted by a, a shadow figure in the mm-hmm. dream, but it, the shadow figure is a representation of the feminine. So I'm very curious, what is going on with the feminine? Why does the feminine feel um, offended in yeah. this dream? Mm-hmm. And at the same time, there's kind of like this uh, stereotypical anima figure that comes in at the end, the lifeguard, the feminine lifeguard, the kind of guiding force, the... Mm-hmm. Uh, the sort of uh, more mature feminine that is looking at the wound. So, yeah, she's a protector. Yeah, she's a protector. Maybe a mother figure, even. Yeah, a, a, a kind of guiding through what's happening. The the kind of anima as like psychopom to kind of navigate through like the unconscious waters. Mm. So I don't know. I, I have so many questions and I can't get them answered. But I I'm just would want the dreamer to consider the relationship to the feminine and not even just necessarily women in his life or feminine like dynamics of his own personality, but just the deep feminine quality of allowing of creation of, of being in the primordial waters of chaos. Maybe his feeling of being resistant to this change is part of it. Maybe there's something else that that brings forward that that constellates in his life. But I wouldn't, look at the big burly figure as like the main focus here because it's, it is representing something of the feminine. And what does that mean for the dreamer? That to me feels like an interesting key to the meaning of this dream. The pane of glass, I think is interesting. Yes. Pulls out a pane of glass yes. from his pocket. Yeah. It does, he doesn't say that like it like grows in size, yeah. but I'm assuming that it's something sort of like weird and the kind of thing that only can happen in a dream is he pulls a window out of his pocket and mm-hmm. throws it at him. Yeah. That's and intense. I know. It's interesting because the, the window, he doesn't, he doesn't call it a window. He calls no. it a glass, but that's kind of how it feels to me. It's like it's something that is translucent, something yes. that you can see through, yes. a gateway of some yes. kind, yes. some yes. sort of vision. Mm-hmm. And maybe like the vision implies higher consciousness, like this shadow figure is throwing higher consciousness at him yes. and like it hurts him Yes. instead of like him like absorbing it and be turning it into gold and being like, oh, I'm like stronger now. It's actually mm-hmm. like, oh, it's in my leg. Wait, it's wounding. He's yeah. not ready to accept this symbol and just sort of expand on that interesting idea of of glass as a symbol. Mm. Um, we kind of see it now in scientific experiments, but like the alchemists became so fascinated with glass. Right. It's odorless. It's durable. It's non-porous. It's impervious to all of the things they're doing. Now you see it in chemistry. Obviously yeah. you have beakers for science, but it's like this transparent vessel, like all of the alchemical imagery that you mm. see, it, it contains the, um, the work being done, the, the changing of the base metals in these glass vessels. Mm. So it, it's representative sort of of that process of transformation or the that which can hold and can contain the dynamics of transformation and change. And it's being hurtled at him. But right now it's uh, something that's bringing pain, that's bringing wounding, but that might change. Right now it feels that way, just like he was drowning in the ocean. Right now, it feels like something that you can't quite get through or that you don't feel like you have the tools for yet. But the lifeguard, the anima, what did she say? Um, it's really in there and it's in there deep or something like that. Mm-hmm. So this this symbol, this this possible sort of container of change, of insight, of seeing into the depths of the mirror is deep, deep within the dreamer. 
and and it's beginning to be accessed in this dream, I think. And there's going to be some sort of shadowy dark figures that are going to feel difficult to deal with. But at, at the core, there is something that's guiding the individual through this change that they're going through in their life. And that might be the Anima figure coming in as the lifeguard, but it might also be the dream ego taking up some strength or new skills as they face um, what reality has to offer in conscious life. If you find this podcast useful, please consider supporting us on Patreon. Go to patreon.com slash golden shadow org. Do you have a dream you'd like us to analyze? Head over to goldenshadow.org to submit your dream for possible interpretation on a future episode. Thanks for listening. Until next time.